Welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast with your host, Buddy Zatello Esquire, Mike Leno, and Evan Ginsberg. Okay, so we were supposed to have a guest on this week, and we don't. And I'm not so thrilled about it. But It's D- Davey O'Hannon, one of the nicest guys in the world. He just told us, though, we were going to also add in and have him pay tribute, not just to the, uh, the two Pete's that we lost or... Sid Udy or a number of other folks, Alpha and the Alpha following Sika. But as, as Evan knows, he said he's just looking, he pulled out one of the first programs and he's looking at him and Bugsy McGraw teaming up against, uh, and this was in a semi main at a smaller Tri WF 70s venue against Kevin Sullivan paired with Haystack Calhoun. Pretty damn big deal. This is when Kevin first came to notoriety in, in, in all of the world. You know, he'd been wrestling for a couple of years, but no one had heard of him. And then he starts working for Vince Sr. And boom, baba, boom. And that's where he met Austin Idol, who was then Iron Mike McCord, managed by Captain Lou Albano. Speaking of which, yeah. How do you like this clip? Bruno uh, versus Lou Albano. Oh, that looks like it's ball. from the garden. No, nah, this is from Baltimore Civic Center. Okay, Baltimore. Well, yeah, showing, sharing stuff with the... Uh, Background filter on doesn't work too well. It's that well, it green came, screen effect. I, I, I want to sum up every every Lou Albano match ever. Lou Albano comes out. He pulls out a foreign object. He, he clocks the face a couple of times. The face grabs the object, at which point Lou, Lou pulls out a blade within visible view to every fan, even in the last row, starts slicing his head. The, the, the face is pounding on him. He runs back to the dressing room. That's every Lou Albano match ever. Wait, didn't he have the courtesy to go underneath the ring apron or something and uh, have his face to the floor? When he got older, he didn't even bother with that. I agree with, with Evan. You it, just see but, him. Hey, but there was no more fun person that I would rather have on this earth than Lou Albano and those promos. He was the king. I think he was much more fun than you know Ernie Roth. Abdullah Farouk, the Grand Wizard, Mr. Clean. Blassie was great, but he was different. Lou Albano, it was genius. He it was, was the guiding light. Huh? It was the guiding light. Oh, and and yeah. Lou Albano influenced my uh, career to become a manager. Because if you can tap that inner Lou Albano as part of your act, and if you've got that wild and crazy side that you can bring into a managerial thing, it's genius. His, his ability to give an interview on the fly and just absolutely have that stream of consciousness. He, Bobby Heenan, um, uh, Jim Cornette, uh, uh, Paul Heyman, a um, uh, 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 couple others, you know, Jimmy Hart. Um, they just, they have that ability to ad lib. Hey, Jimmy in- Hart though, Memphis. Forget about the Tri WF stuff. The Memphis stuff for Jimmy Hart was was far better. Gary Hart, did we mention Gary Hart? Sure. Gary Hart, Hart wasn't what didn't have an above the top character. His his thing was sinister and evil, but like a straight line always. He he didn't he didn't get outraged or anything like that. He wouldn't give you the the highs and lows like Lou Albano would give you. You know, he was just more of a straight line man. Sure, there's certainly, you know, guys that are good that can do that and have that sort of calm and concentrated uh, 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 image. But Lou Albano, when he would get wild with the Wild Samoans, and we were talking before about, you know, what a devastating tag team that was and how they ruled the WWE, Tri WF and then WWF for so many years as a major force in tag team wrestling was because that that three-way combination of having a wild manager along with the wild Samoans was something that really wrestling hadn't had before. Evan, though, wouldn't you say Russ probably didn't get to see the, uh, like, 70, well, say 74, for example, Valiance with Albano. I think that's when Lou was, like, at his best. They were really, like, inseparable, those three. Johnny Valiant told me they would go into the studio and all they would get was August 1st, 1975, Valiant versus whomever, you know, uh, Danucci and Rivera, whoever. And, And then they would just riff and they would play off of each other. It was all stream of consciousness. 
All they knew was the date and the venue and the opponent and everything else. Nothing was scripted. Not nothing. What well, they just would cut promo after promo after promo all day, and one was funnier than the next. No and, promo would be more than five minutes long either. Yeah, and the valiants, the valiants. It was like jazz musicians riffing off of each other, and and Lou and. And it would just like build. It would just get crazier and crazier, <laughs> and, and uh, it was and it was funny. And you wanted to see them murdered. It was like a perfect combination. Yeah. What, you know, Albano managed the Blackjacks when they yeah. came in, but there was supposedly one at one venue only, and I don't know if it was at the Cap Center. Uh, it wasn't in Philly or Boston, but the Blackjacks against. The Valiants, and I don't know where I Lou, never heard that. Yeah, I don't know where Lou would have been. Um, I never heard that, but who knows? That was before my wrestling. It's before uh, Russ was born. Yeah, I think it was. Or it might have been right yeah. at. Okay. Yeah, Named nearly all of the, uh, the, the incredible tag teams. You know, the Lumberjacks, the Execution. Tanaka and Fuji, who I think they all managed. Blassie. Fuji and Saito. Yeah. Bulldogs when he when he uh, turned face. But it's what's hard to understand is with all the talent that there is today, I still think the tag team scene is pretty weak. I'm not thrilled with what we see in tag teams today. Yeah, WWE, to WWE has, you know, virtually no tag teams. And AEW, they just slapped together 6, 8, 10, 12. 27 guys and well, the, oh. the young bucks are a great team they've been yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, they're a real are they i mean they they're they're not young bucks anymore that's for sure you know they're, they're the old bucks they're the the, the you know they, they've been passed around for a little for, for a while even though they're the one act that has never come to the wwe they're like the, they're trying to pull the sting thing off where you know um they do their whole career outside maybe like at the very end let's talk about that let's, evan have you watched the pay-per-view last night the, all no the, i didn't see it i didn't, didn't see, see it, it. Don't, don't tell me no. any spoilers all right i don't want to tell you any spoilers although i've heard the cage match is insane and uh, not to be missed you can uh, youtube it i believe um just insane I'm trying yeah to but the, uh, unfortunately all the rogue sites got taken down not that I would know anything about that, but all the, the rogue sites, you know, got dismantled in the, for the last AEW pay-per-view. And all the, uh, the, uh, the rumor has it that the Reddit sites were all kind of scraped out, you know, by the, uh, 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 by the authorities. So like, well, I, I heard the zone put the whammy on a lot of those sites. They, they paid good money to get their tech people to uh, zap those sites. It's a lot. I mean, the, the kind of, but one thing that, you know, they really can't stop is once it's on the air, you know, uh, people will download it and make it available through BitTorrenting so that, you know, if you can wait like 24 hours, you can usually then get it off of other sites because it's almost impossible. Once it's been out on the air, I mean, for them to control that. I mean, people can record it on their computers and then make it available on these file sharing sites. So, you know, that's what allegedly some people will do with the WrestleManias and the, the other pay-per-views. Yeah. They're not, you know, he got them. so cheap now. There's no reason to. Well, I mean, it adds up. I mean, you know, that's the one thing. I mean, this is what I'm worried about with all pro sports in general that they're taking football games and putting them on Amazon, they're putting them on Prime, and they're putting them on uh, Netflix. And soon, I mean, I, I, I think in, you know, less than 20 years, we might be in a situation where you have to pay, if you want to watch 82 games of basketball, you got to watch it on 82 different channels. Oh, yeah. buy each hey, one. Hey, Netflix to watch. Uh, eight, right. You'll have to get 82 eight. different subscriptions, yearly subscriptions, and they'll just say, oh, well, it's only $15 a piece. So if you do 82 times, you know, 15, you're only going to have to pay $1,600 on top of everything else to watch, you know, all your 
your NBA games. Well, so. let me ask the both of you guys. Are you both, either of you guys, are both getting Netflix yet? No, I'm never getting Netflix. Are you kidding me? No. I, I haven't watched WWE Raw since 2016. That was my New Year's resolution, not to squander another Monday night. Right. And it's still going to be on regular broadcast TV. They're just going to have it on, like, maybe a Saturday or show or something. You know what? Good riddance. I, I'm not... I, I don't have a Netflix subscription. I'm no, not no, getting... they're not going to have it. It's not going to be on there. You might be able to watch the Spanish thing, but you're not going to be able to hear any of the commentary. You know what? Um, I don't look at that as being a terrible thing either. But by and large, I, if if the WWE is disappears from my existence, it's not going to affect me at all. I mean, I, I will... I'll, in fact, it gives me more time to watch AEW and just focus on that instead of having to try to watch the schlock that's going on in the WWE. And I'll probably find a way to, to you know, check out, even at least on YouTube a few days later, what went on on the pay-per-views. And you know what? That'll probably suffice. Don't miss Friendship Bracelet 3 in WWE. Uh. See, I don't feel I'm missing anything. Yeah, that's CM Punk and Drew McIntyre still fighting over the bracelet. In fact, you know what's what what I'm what I'm finding interesting is tr finding some of my other friends that have been in the business and seeing what they're doing outside of wrestling. For instance, I don't know if you know that there's a show called Twisted Metal that came out um, during the year this year, mm -hmm. and it's got uh, Samoa Joe in it as the body of a guy named Sweet Tooth. The psychotic clown, and then they have Will Arnett's voice, and you know he's wearing this clown mask, the psycho clown mask. Is this a cartoon anime? No, no, it's a live action thing. It's what's it's it, what's uh, it called? Twisted Metal. And if you it, like it, things it blowing up, come out. If you like things blowing up, that's when something that you'll enjoy. When did it produced or released? Uh, that it was. It just the season just finished, like this year. Where do you see it? What's its carriage? Like? Oh man, I'm trying to remember. You know, I gotta admit, I forget whether stuff is on Amazon or whether it's on Netflix. I think it's a Netflix series. I think it's a Netflix series, but don't, don't fans don't flood me with. You'll probably look it up on. But yeah, it's 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 got Samoa Joe's the physical body. He gets to pantomime all these things, but the voice of Will Arnett. It's he's wearing this psycho clown mask and. And and uh, 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 the voice of Will Arnett, you know, the the, the actor is is the voice of, of Sweet Tooth, and it's 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 wonderful. If you like post-apocalyptic stuff, and I have to love post-apocalyptic stuff, then it's it's up your alley. If you're looking for you know Shakespearean. If you're looking for something Shakespearean, you probably shouldn't be watching a thing called Twisted Metal. It was based on a video game. That's my my general. I, Evan, this might not be right up your alley, but you yeah. might find it. Mike, you have a, your, your your love of the destructive can sometimes be be your credit. So. Well, I'm willing to give anything a look, and I, I'm pleased to hear though at least season one and two of Heels is is on Netflix, which I don't have yet, but. That means that they're if they get ratings and views, they supposedly will try to produce a season three at least. So that's good. Yeah, you know, Evan, if if you do have Netflix and the Heels is on Netflix, I would su strongly suggest you watch both seasons just to see what what Mike and I have been talking about. For I watched I watched two or three episodes and I felt like I had lived through all of it, like it was like a repeat. Second season, second season. They kind of see it coming that it's going to end a little bit. So I think they got in stuff that they were going to maybe save for future episodes. There's a couple of things where they're just talking to the audience directly in the guise of of training the wrestlers, but it's as if it's a speech that wrestlers are giving to the audience about how yeah. wrestling psychology works. And it's it's worth it's worth the price of admission. I think it's it's something that I think has been overlooked as far as like wrestling wisdom being just sort of thrown to the public, and and it's worth it. It's the second season's better than the first 
except for the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger that we know was never going to get resolved. That's the the only the only problem with it. You Did you guys it. ever see the show uh, I'm Dying Up Here? It's about the uh, stand-up comedy scene in the yeah. 70s yeah, out in good. L.A. And um, the last episode, the lead character is like all coked out and has a heart attack. And you don't know if he's living or dead. And then they canceled the series. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I enjoyed that. Uh, what was the hangers are always tough. But, but the guy's still hanging there eight years later or whatever. Yeah, well, they can come back. He's in a coma, you know, that kind of thing. They can, you know, always do that, you know, uh, TV. Well, I love that up. show. The show is great. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is tough because you can fall in love with these shows that are on Netflix. And Netflix is known for, like, only committing to two or three years and then just pulling the plug, you know, even when it's doing well. This was Showtime and it, same, same Showtime, thing. same kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, they get into these series, but budget wise, they don't have enough money to go into it a third season. That, that was one of the reasons behind The Walking Dead is that it was such a short first season because they didn't think it would be popular enough. They had to convince really all these TV execs. And that's why, you know, AM, AMC finally took it. Because all these other stations turned it down. They're still said, milking that. Yeah. Well, they said a show about zombies where people die all the time. No one's going to watch that. And they said, yeah, it's going to be tough. We're going to kill off a lot of key characters, like every show. And they're like, no, no one's going to like that. And, you know, they said, we have such a low budget. We'll hire, you know, nobody actors. And we'll put all the money that we have into the zombie special effects. And of course... Ten years later, you know, it was a huge success and spawned all these uh, uh, offshoots. But I, I haven't watched any of the offshoots of The Walking Dead. I don't know if you still do, Evan. Uh, I'm still catching up on some of them, but uh, I, I like the I like the one with uh, Rick and uh, Michonne. See, I haven't. I, I now that's something I found felt formulaic after a little while. That the the, the Walking Dead stopped being you know unique to me and just started following a pattern every show and i got tired of rick and um uh uh, uh and megan fighting each other like hand to hand like two feet away from each other shooting guns at each other and throwing axes and knives and burning buildings with zombies and both of them walk out of the building without a scratch you know it's kind of like, at least the hair was messed up Oh, yeah, I, and sometimes they weren't. And then, you yes. know, Rick would miss, you know, Negan, but then, like, use his gun and shoot, like, a zombie, like, a mile and a half away from the hip, you know, and hit it right in the in the center of the head. But then, like, you know, he's firing at Negan, and he can't hit him, like, standing, like, two feet. It yeah, felt like right. 18 after a little while, where you just would have all this gunfire happening and then nobody getting actually hit, which, you know, now that we've, you know, had two mass shootings this week, at, at schools, um, an unfortunate message that, you know, gunfire does hit a lot of unintended targets. Well, speaking of gunfire, we got the debate on Tuesday. Very quickly, I, I got a text from uh, my friend since the first season of Globe, Jeannie Basson, Hollywood. I want to ask, well, either you guys watch uh, Party Down on Stars. That was uh, not quite in the league of what you're talking about, but it, yeah, no, I, 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 we watched all of the whole series. The, the, it was like on three seasons. Yeah, it, it spawned was, a lot of great actors. Yeah, a it. ton of people came out of that. It was, What's it about? It's a bunch of catering. out of work actors are working for a Hollywood based catering company, hoping to make connections. So they're all, um, uh, they're I, all like, yeah, it, while, while they're trying to cater, politicking, all, they're politicking to try to get hired, uh, you know, because- And they hate the job. They can't stand the job. They can't they stand the being caterers. The guy that runs it is a complete buffoon. He's sort of like, uh, I don't Michael know- Michael from, uh, from The Office. From The Office. Yeah, it was a really great show. So here's what Jeannie said very quickly. She just got back from Seattle where she did a PAX West convention uh, signing autographs for a video game that she originally did in 1994 called Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. It was a video game. Again, she was hired in 94. Uh, limited run games bought the rights to it, and they're now 
formatting it on PlayStation 5 and N Nintendo. And um, it's going to be in her new book that's loaded with my photos, The True Glow Hollywood Story by Jeannie Bassan. Hooray for Hollywood is the actual main title. And that comes out very shortly. And she looks pretty spectacular on the cover. So we well, were... I, I have her booked for October again with uh, my friend Casey Wood and his wife, where we're going to talk again about horror films. That's one of my favorite shows of the year, is doing our Holly, our Halloween show with her. So we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll have her on. Casey Wood, Casey Wood sounds like a porn name. No, that's my friend. Uh, I'm Kid joking. Crump. That's my friend Kid Chrome that I work with at APW. Oh, kid! Well, you guys can't make it. I put Everybody him on the show. He's, he's one of our. He's my connection to the Pacific Northwest. When I make my porn debut, it's going to be. Uh, I'm going to be Casey Wood. I like that. It's catchy. Really? No. Well, <laughs> it could be Willie Getwood. What, what will your wife think? What more? Probably, what will your cats think? If yes. you, you know, get involved in a. In a porn flick. How are your cats? Since oh my God! I, I had I had a catastrophe. I took uh, the cat to the vet for the first time, and she tried to escape. It was like escape from Alcatraz. She was climbing the walls. She was knocking stuff over. It was insane. Did you get her? Did you get her to the vet? No, this was this was in the vet's At office. The vet's office. Trashing oh the vet's God. office. Oh my God. So, so, so how did so, the vet like finally calm her down enough to get her to? They 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 basically got her back into the carrier and uh, the other one they never let out and uh, the next day they sedated them and gave them their shots and spayed and neutered them. That's a rough week for the for the cats. Jeez. Wow. Hopefully but they'll they'll. Are they the rescues? What's that? Are they rescues? Yeah yeah yeah. They were living under a car uh, in, wow. in a garage. So. Uh, they hit the uh, cat, the cat lotto with us, boy. No, that's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. I, you know, my dog Chance is a rescue also, and and I just, my heart is big for anybody that goes through the domestication process of a of a basically feral animal. I mean, we had to go through it with Chance. He wasn't mean or or scary to anybody, but he peed all over our hallway a million times. So. You know, you, you just have to accept it when you take in an animal from that that didn't grow up with people or didn't grow up in a house. Mike, Mike and I accepted when you always peed in the hallway, but it's worked out since. Yeah, yeah exactly. We put some plastic down. Let me they, suggest that you guys, anybody adopt a senior animal. They're, they're usually housebroken already. They are so grateful. And uh, that's, that's all of our... Dogs have been rescues, but particularly senior dogs who some people, you know, won't give a second look to. They're, you know, you can get seven, eight, nine years out of them. So, yeah, and if you can adopt a black cat, if you can adopt a pit bull. Yeah, my you know? my cat, one of my cats is black. I'm not racist. No, I mean, but black cats apparently are are the hardest to adopt out because people have that suspicion against yeah. them that they're bad luck. Oh, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, so. It is ridiculous. I Same know. ridiculousness that people say that pit bulls are all vicious, nasty dogs. It depends and on the owner and the way they... they it treat. really does. And and I got to say, Chance has been one of the nicest, genuine, uh, uh, greatest family dogs that we've we've had. And I've adopted and, and, and helped out and fostered dozens of different dogs so you know it's, what kind of dog it, is he you've never shown him on he's camera. a pit he's a he's a pit bull a white pit mix of some type and uh but gentle and just totally loves my daughter goes anywhere my daughter goes and does whatever my daughter wants to do to him she wants to dress him up and put hats on him and stuff like that he just puts up with it because anything for 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 my daughter and that's the way my dog is so hopefully i yeah, as you said I, your wife is better off with the cats than you are, right? She, they like they trust her. She's very uh, patient, and uh, you know they they won't really let you pet them yet. You you, you could feed them ha by hand, etc. But uh, they're feral, so it's it's it takes time. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No, I, I have another friend who adopted a feral cat. The mother won't deal with it, but the the uh, the kitten. 
learned to adopt, you know, get associated with him, and now she's super cuddly. So hopefully that'll happen with you guys. So I mean, you know, um, I'm not sure what since we had a different schedule, different guest schedule for tonight. We don't have that, so I'm not really sure what other topics we have to throw out there. How's your book going, Evan? I, you know, we haven't talked about that in a little bit. Um, it's which which one? <laughs> Mike, tell me about the Tolos book. Uh, well, the Blackboards and then the Tolos book are, you know. What, but, what, this other book with Jeff Archer was completed. Evan's done a tremendous amount of work. We're waiting on me. Uh, I, a couple more people I want to interview. I want to get my old Mac finally into. I have to take it to some place where they can retrieve a lot of the info. Uh, because I have, you know. Oh, just a ton of, of photos on there that I don't have physically. Uh, I'm trying to bring up something right here. Well, geez, I can't give any of the results out to Evan who hasn't seen the, the pay-per-view. Uh, you know, I just didn't feel like, you know, I just did that two weeks ago, not even two weeks ago. Four hours plus the pre-show, it was like a nine-hour day for All In, in at Wembley. And I just didn't, you know... Instead, my wife and I watched uh, Only Murders in the Building. Uh, we marathoned through that yesterday. I think I had more fun. I just, you know, you can get burned That's out. That's a clever show. That's I, a clever show. I saw the first season. I haven't seen the, the new season yet. Full I of do. stars. Stars yes. that everybody wants to be on it. Well, and it, makes, it reminds me of what life in New York is like. You know, it's have, very have you New York. I never saw it. I saw Glenn Hansard from uh, the Swell season and the movie Once the other night in concert. That guy's so great. Oh, my God. But do you have any movie reviews for us, Evan? Have you seen anything recently? Movie I saw, I saw uh, M. Night uh, Shyamalan, Ding Dong, whatever his last name is. <laughs> I saw Trap. And uh, the, the first, like, 40 minutes is, is pretty interesting. Uh, the serial killer... The entire concert that he brings his teen daughter to uh, is, a, is a trap to, to get him. And uh, ultimately, you know, spoiler alert, he, he gets out of the concert area. And that's when the movie just falls apart. It's just it's just ridiculous. I mean, isn't ridiculous. that like every one of his movies? They start off about a half hour is interesting. And then it's like a Twilight Zone episode that won't end. Yeah, the, uh, the his movie old. I, I I thought I was aging as I watched it. It was like it was like ninety minutes. It felt like it was ninety hours. But he, he's also he's done some excellent films along the way. It's I would just, debate that. I would debate that. I actually think all of his stuff is schlock. I think all of his stuff. The first is one schlock. people loved it that was up for an award, but from here's then, the problem: the best film is The Sixth Sense, correct? Yes. Okay. What if you saw The Sixth Sense? And the first time you saw Bruce Willis, you got a clue that Bruce Willis was dead and that he was talking to dead people the entire time. What if you figure that out in 15 minutes, which is exactly what I did? And then you're waiting for the rest of the movie for everybody else to figure it out. And you're like, guys, there's so many clues that are telling you that everybody here is dead and you know that Bruce Willis is dead. And then when he finally says, I see dead people, you're like, well, duh! That is my response to the Sixth Sense. Signs is one of the dumbest movies ever made. Ever made. Aliens that have the ability to come to Earth from another planet and they can beat Einsteinian physics to do so. And the one thing they can't handle is water. You come to a planet that's 80% water and that's your number one vulnerability is rain? Come on. They don't even have spacesuits to like cover themselves. Uh, how can they personally go down to the earth so they can get killed by rain, water on a planet? We, we don't even do that. We're not that stupid. If we could build, if we could build spaceships that could go light years away, we're not sending humans over to do it. This is my number one problem with stuff like Avatar and Signs and all this shit. We're not going to send human beings to another planet that we haven't been to ourselves. We're going to send drones. We're going to send robots. We're going to send, you know, unpiloted stuff. And if there's anything there that could hurt us, we're going to send so many friggin' nukes to that planet and blow it up so badly 
without ever a human being being anywhere in sight. Because that's what we are. We're big cowards. Why can't we? I thought they were going to send our criminals to uh, help for us. You know, they could send Trump up there to some. Yeah, now that that I don't. And Elon Musk. Fine. Elon Musk wants to go. 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 Thinks Elon Musk is crazy. Better not be voting for Trump because he's going to get a cabinet position, which is nuts. I'm not what, me voting for Trump. No, I know I, none of us That's are. That's a laugh. Yeah. And Listeners. Evan's not voting for Trump. Trump I can tell you yeah. that much. Well, it's you're not, the one closest to to the Republicans where you live. You know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. The, you know, Carl Land, but the. Uh, in Wrestlers for a Launch, Trump and Harris Tuesday, they've not touched before. They've never met, never come close to each other, never. I don't think they've even I been. Hope, I hope he doesn't grab her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but Trump knows all about her because he was on a helicopter with supposedly Willie Brown, and they almost crashed. And while, all, all while the, the helicopter was crashing. Willie Brown wrote in the Chronicle, I saw what he wrote, and uh, he's thinking of suing Trump. You know, Trump. Uh, it's, it's what Willie sure, Brown he never made, damages, but mixed up his black people. Yeah, uh, tr- Trump said he had a flight log that he could prove that he was on the same helicopter as Willie Brown. That was like a month ago, and he still hasn't pr- provided it. Anyone that believes anything Trump says at this point in time is truly hopeless. And I don't care if you're a listener of this show and that pisses you off. In fact, go ahead and come, you know, come at me. If you if you're a listener to yeah, this show and you Russ, love Trump, just don't go ahead. Trump, but come at go after Russ, but do not vote for Trump. Yeah, fine. You know, no. I don't mind. I I don't mind that flack because you know what, he disgusts me to so such a large degree, and the Republicans disgust me at such a large degree because of this whole shooting, the school shooting stuff, and nothing being done about it. I mean, I, unlike you guys. I have kids that are that age. Yeah, I know. It's it's a, it's, well, it's shock. Marjorie my kids just turned 13. She came out on it. Yeah, my kids just came out, are, are just turned 13, and the school shooter is 14 years old. You know? I think Marjorie Taylor Greene needs to be either in a, a, a last or first blood or a, a death match with MJF. I think, I think that kid, <laughs> the kid's name was Culp. If they named them after a gun, that, that was the first sign things were going to go wrong. That's that's there's trouble. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my my kids are not named after weaponry, you know. Yeah. And, and they're named after wrestling. Balls. I don't understand. So the dad gives them access to the gun, but the mother claims she called the school to warn them that he was in a foul mood or something when he left. Why didn't she go stop him? Why is she just calling the school? Because he probably would have shot her. Oh, well, maybe. You know, I mean, the the other the other reoccurring theme with all of this is uh, they said this kid was uh, terribly bullied. Not that that excuses it by any means, but but the point being, at at some point, you you have to teach these kids not to, not to bully. As horrible, repo- too many teen suicides, too many shootings. Evan, in my in my neighborhood, the, the, my kid, there's two schools. My kids go to San Jose, and there's another one called Sinaloa. Sinaloa school, what, uh, eight kids were punished for beating up two kids. One kid was being beaten up by eight kids, and another kid tried to defend that kid, and the other eight beat those kids up. And other kids were standing around encouraging it and using their cell phones to record what was going on. None of them went and called the authorities and tried to break it up. Except the one kid who got beaten up. And that was that those are kids my kids age, right in the school, right next to where my kids go to school. So it happened right in my neighborhood. And I did tell my kids if that ever happened, if they if they were responsible for filming, taping, <laughs> something like that, or encouraging that kind of violence, the the repercussions on them would be severe and ones that would be long lasting to them. And, you know, every parent, the fact that, and then I asked my, my friend and my kids if they, any of the ki- other kids had talked about it in school and nobody had. None of, the, none of the, the other kids discussed that with their parents. Their parents didn't even bother to talk about it with them. And that's where a lot of this out of control violence is coming from. A total disconnect by parents that don't want to teach their kids any kind of like empathy 
moral standing with their with where they live and who they live with and people's lives just turn into nothing and they, because kids don't value the lives of the people around them that's how you can have a situation occur like what we just had and i'm sorry to soapbox this but we have so, the time all right guys before that. i leave let me just ask both of you what kind of heat are you having we're having 100 degrees here in orange county bizarro world what, oh, it was cool here. it was 64 today it's, it's been the, in the 90s around here it's that last like Cal California, you know, uh, Indian summer that's just like punching it's us right now. Global warming, I think. It's where is every year it's getting hotter, progressively hotter. We're right on the water. You know, I don't know what to say. I mean, I I think there is a lot of impact, and you know, a lot of uh, scientists said we've already passed the tipping point to fix it. You know, I'm hoping maybe my kids' generation be smarter than ours we had a chance to fix it and we didn't you know and and that's to our discredit we didn't implement solar we you know didn't do recycling until it was too late we're still stuck on fossil fuels which i thought we'd be done with uh, i'll leave you with this thought what did trump trump say oh well, it still snows in the winter the global warming is a, a, it's a scientific wizard yeah clean coal is the answer to everything clean uh, coal. Okay. good night i gotta i gotta take off all right, I'll see you next week. Bye, Mike. So now it's just us. Us alone. This, this, this show was about 5% wrestling. I know. <laughs> Look, hey, stuff like that happens. It's, it's like Seinfeld. It's a show about nothing. It's a know. show about wrestling that isn't about wrestling. Well, we have those every once in a while. It's just stream of consciousness. And hey, you know, you, the viewer, A, you can just pay less for this episode, which is free. You know, so I'll give you double your money back for watching this. And then B, you know, at least we had an episode this week, which could have just not had one. And then all of you who are watching would be entertained for this 38 minutes or whatever we we're going to wind up having for the total show. But uh, I mean, any any progress on the Tolos book? You haven't. We um, <coughs> Honestly, you know, except for what Mike wants, Mike wants to interview um, two or three more people, and he has to uh, basically go through thousands of his pictures. And you know, it's as near done as it could be at this point. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get it out sometime in the following year. And uh, my book. Um, my, my, I wrote a hundred um, story book, um, but my production editors had some issues, some minor issues like his wife dying and his best friend killing himself. So, um, you know, so I understand and people have to understand sometimes. Yeah, uh, but you were so close to having it done. So I'd love to see it, you know. Actually. So would I. Before I die, I'd like to see it. It's called Wrestling Rings. Before I die. Wrestling rings, blackboards, and movie sets, and it's a hundred short stories about my life, making the movie The Wrestler. And um, you've read a few on the air here, and I really like them. I really uh, like the stories that you have. Yeah, uh, a lot of it was written during COVID, and it's from the heart. And um, I would say um, a third of it is about people I've lost along the way wrestler friends personal friends family um yeah so you know they say you can't rush art <laughs> we're certainly not rushing these things are taking years but let me say this let me say this from from day one to the day we completed it the wrestler took seven years and 350 days took six years so sometimes when you take your time and you know you could do things right you know, uh, WWE and all these people churn out product and uh, it varies in quality. It really, really varies. And, uh, you know, you, I mean, the wrestler, uh, literally seven years. Wow. Well, you know, we're all looking forward to it when it does get ready and get produced and, you know. Yeah, I'm everything. hoping I'm hoping I'll still be on this planet by the time, <clears throat> by the well, time we get out there. There are other production options that, you know, we, if you can, you know, either find out from your friend if he's really going to, you know, produce it or 
if you know maybe that's well, he's working he's working on it it's just uh he had a very rough stretch um yeah it was uh a four year stretch that's the problem yeah, yeah four, it's like it's like a stint in prison speaking yeah, yeah. of that speaking of that go see the movie sing sing tremendous film Oh, okay. I, it's gotten great reviews. I oh my God, it's it, it's it's a true story about a theatrical troupe in Sing Sing prison, and a lot of the actors are the actual ex prisoners. And um, tremendous film, you know, heart wrenching, and it's n- it's n- no violence. It's none of like the tip. It's not what you expect from a prison film. It's these guys are like beaten down and demoralized and. Doing theater, um, you know, brings them back, brings them back psychologically, emotionally. And uh, it's a beautiful film. I, I think uh, there's going to be nominations for it. Shot on pennies. It feels like a documentary. It's just like you're walking into this prison and boom, you learn who these guys are. And it, 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 it feels real because it is real. They're the actual prison is most of the cast. It's wild. Great film. Uh, you know, that's the other thing is that I, I've always enjoyed your movie reviews. So <clears throat> it's always nice to get a movie review in on, on well, our show. I had a guy say to me, and to me, this is typical of the stupidity out there. Guy goes, if a movie doesn't make a billion dollars, what's the point? Wrestler didn't make a billion dollars. I mean, it's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. Thank you. And it made me cry. It made me cry at the end. And this was before I really knew you, too. I was, it, I, you know, I'm not just saying that because I'm on the show here. It really moved me. And it even changed the way that I view my relationship with my kids because of the, 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 the whole interaction between Mickey Rourke and his daughter in the film. And I, I, I was at I was at the uh, Lincoln Center New York Film Festival for the uh, screening of The Wrestler 2008, and um, you know I'm sitting there, and the scene where he says to his daughter, "I'm just a broken down piece of meat." I look around, and everybody's crying. Everybody's crying, and and I just said to myself. It works. It works. I mean, you well, can't take crying, you know? Well, what I said, again, before I knew you and all of that, was that there are there are actors that find roles, okay? You know, you audition for it, you get a role. But there are roles that find actors. And that's what the wrestler was for Mickey Rourke. Well, I'll tell you a story that a lot of people don't know. I'm, I'm sitting with Aronofsky, just the two of us. And he says, we, we, we had just met with Nicolas Cage, who was a big star 2007 or so. And uh, he was a huge top box office star at the time. And we couldn't get the funding for the wrestler. We wanted 36, we wanted 30, we wanted 18 million and we got 6 million. And we got a third of what we needed. And it was almost like guerrilla filmmaking. A lot of those were real wrestling fans at real wrestling shows because we didn't have the money for, for thousands of extras. And so um, I'm sitting with Aronofsky and he says to me, uh, he says to me, Mickey's the right guy. He's the right guy. And even though Nicolas Cage was the biggest star and it would have been bigger box office, you know, Aronofsky's an artist and that's just the way he thinks, and and I'm not know. sure it would have been bigger box office to be honest with you, even if it had Nick Cage, because I don't think it would have been as believable. I think that that Mickey Rourke made it such a believable thing that people went out and said, "You got to go see this movie. You have to see this because this role, this is to me, Mickey Rourke as Randy was the equivalent of of of." Uh, Sylvester Stallone being Rocky, that there was. I said, I said, I said one one night. I I said to Mickey at one of the other film festivals. I said, um, I said, what did what did you think of the movie? And he says to me, "quote I can't watch it. It reminds me of my life." 
You know, he, he was a big star in the 80s and he walked away and he was getting punched in the face as a boxer, which is unheard of. I mean, that's not a career traje- trajectory in Hollywood to he go was a from joke. that age. I mean, he was really known as a joke, you know, and, and it changed everything for him. But it changed the way a lot of people look at wrestling. I think it has. The people that have seen it understand and treat wrestling different than the people who haven't seen it. And, well, and you know, Jim, Jim, like Cornette, Jim Cornette, who I'm a big fan of, I think the Midnight Express was the greatest tag team of all time. Cornette didn't like it because he's like, we don't all live in trailers, but some do. Some do. And, and I, many- I've been there. I, it's, it, when I was watching that, I was like, oh, man, that reminds me of, of when Wrestler X had to, you know, ran out of gas money and he had to stay in town and then the next day like have his wife like uh 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 western union money to him so he could get gas i've western union money to uh wrestler friends i've given i've given like the last like other than the gas i had to get back home i've given the rest of the cash that was in my wallet to the guy to like the ring crew and to uh refs that hadn't eaten like since like for like a day and a half they like were working all day long and the 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 promotion didn't have enough money even buy like to get them a one dollar cheeseburger like they were like oh thank god it's the first thing i've eaten in two days and that's what they'll do because they're like we want we didn't want to stop we knew the ring truck was late and had a flat tire and 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 we got pulled over and you know like a million like stories that go on with all these indie wrestlers, you know, as they try to make their way to the show. And we were doing shows, you know, in CCW, literally out in the middle of nowhere. So everyone had to drive like three hours to get there. There's almost nobody lived right by there. And and so, you know, people were spending what, and this was when gas was really expensive too. In California, it was like over $5 a gallon. So people were just saving their money so they could get enough money just to get the gas to drive to the CCW show and perform. And once they were done, they were broke. And they didn't have, maybe they got $20. That wouldn't give them enough gas to drive back home. In 2024, a lot of these indie guys are getting $20. If they get anything at all. Yeah, yeah. Hot dog, a handshake. Yeah, and then they don't get the hot dog. And, you know, that's that. I've, I've, I've seen it, and yet I've seen so many people, like, like that guy Chupacabra we had on just a couple couple weeks ago just put in so much and get so little back and yet they keep doing it for their whole lives and that's maybe it's like the music stuff that you've covered and we've talked about you know that they'll do it for the love of it and and same thing here i mean i've done 200 shows i don't get paid for any of these shows yet i wouldn't trade uh, well okay i trade the ones where mike lano books the wrong kind of guest for us but other than other than that, I wouldn't trade any of these shows for anything because they're all precious to me. I look back on the shows with Tony Jones, okay, and with J.J. McGuire, all right? And those are the only times I've – that's the last time I would ever talk to Tony Jones. It was the you know only time I ever got to know J.J. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, with wrestling, uh, the longevity, you know <laughs> – uh, you, you do enough shows, some of the guests are going to pass. And, um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm glad I've done these, you know. I'm glad I have them, you know, as a record of, of me reaching out and connecting back with people again like like Chupacabra was for me. You know, I hadn't talked to him in over 20 years. Why? Just time moves. And without having an excuse like this show to talk to him, just people slide right under the curtain. They just go slide right on by out of your life. And before you know it, a year turns into five years, turns into 20 years. You know? And it just is amazing how much time goes. Anyway, I'm not going to bore everybody with all this philosophical stuff. It's kind of wrestling related, but it isn't really. But, you know, we, without guessing. Well, wrestling, if you really are involved on the indie level, and we both have in different capacities, um, you know, it's almost like a surrogate family. 
and uh, the, many times the promoter is like a surrogate dad and some every once in a blue moon you have a female promoter and it's like there's a what? reason why everyone calls each other brother you know in the business and i said that i said that exact same thing at tony jones funeral and i was like you know it's the weird family because normally if you really took a cross section of the entire wrestling you know federations that you're in none of these people probably should be together for any other reason there's no real reason for me as a lawyer to hang out with a guy who works at a you know packing plant that another guy that you know is a security dude at night and we all have nothing in common you know and yet we do bond ourselves into this weird traveling family and you know what i, what I said at tony jones's funeral i said when you're when the number of wrestlers you have at your show outnumbers the audience that comes, you really feel like that you guys really are like together. You did all this and that you still do a good show, even though you know you can hear the fans talking to each other in the front row. And that's all there is, is the front row, because there's nobody there's not even enough people to fill up any other rows. You know? Um, and you still see these guys put everything into that. And that, that to me is the most touching part of professional wrestling is that we all put together and we do the show because just like Chupi was saying, people paid to see us perform. Sometimes they don't, but most of the time they're paying to see you perform, whatever. They took the time out of their Saturday evenings or Sundays or Friday nights to come out and see, see you perform. Even if it's 10 people and you owe it to them even if it's one person. And that kind of integrity and in doing the show no matter what is always something that I believe in and something that, that touches yeah, Absolutely. Me. And um, any, any art that you create, um, I, I get very tired of the cynical, uh, but it didn't make money. Well, you know, follow your muse and create and whether it does or doesn't, you need to do it for whatever reason. And as long as you have something that you're proud of, you can go back to and say, you know what? I really had a good time doing this and this meant something to me. And whether it means anything to anybody else, that's not so important. You get older, you start realizing you do stuff because yeah, it helps other people, but it also means something to you. And that's what the show means to me. That's why we do it. Anyway, I'll let you go. We're a little bit early. And check, check out Evan Ginsberg's Old School Wrestling Memories on Facebook, people. Great you page. Enjoy it. Great page. You know, right. I'm a contributor. And uh, a lot of great old school stuff on there. And uh, and we'll, we'll catch you all next week, everyone. Good night.